It is becoming ever clearer that Western politicians and journalists are trying to stoke a new Cold War with China. And to that end, one of the key lines that keeps being repeated is that China's investments in the developing world represent a new form of imperialism. That was a narrative pushed by the BBC's Zainab Badawi when interviewing Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados. Take a look at how Motley expertly pushes back against the line of questioning from the BBC host. I honestly would like to know why we in Barbados are so ingratiated with China, why are we in so deep with China? So are you swapping one superpower for another? Well, once again, I regret that the person who asked the question doesn't know our history. In 1977, Barbados established relations with the People's Republic of China. And therefore, to suggest that we are now seeking to ingratiate ourselves with China means that you don't understand where we've come from or what we're doing. Um, any country that lives in this world today to exist in this world ought to have relations with every country. And China is clearly a global power. And for us not to have a relationship with China, even if we didn't have one 47 years ago, would be foolish. But you've been very complimentary about China. You had a phone conversation with President Xi mm -hmm. Jinping recently. You said... This is all about strengthening the relationship with mm -hmm. China. In 2019, mm -hmm. the government signed up to the BRI, the big infrastructure project and so on. And some people are suspicious. They think that China wants to buy the family silver. But let's put it this way. I've also been very complimentary of the Americans and the British and the Canadians. So that for me not to be complimentary of China seems unusual. And similarly, for persons who believe that because we want to be friendly with China means that we are a pawn, tells us what they think about us in the first place, because we are capable of being, as one, our first prime minister said, friends of all and satellites of none. But it's not just Barbados that's moving closer no. to China, it's the whole of the Caribbean. I it's, mean, it's the whole investment world. from China has gone up many folds But so is the, the whole world. If, if, you, if I look correctly, I think the Chinese hold a large, large percentage of assets within the United States of America and a large amount of their treasuries as well. So. <laughs> For you to focus on the Caribbean or Africa with China without recognizing the role that China is playing in Europe or in the North Atlantic countries is a bit disingenuous and really reflects more that we are seen as pawns, regrettably, rather than countries with equal capacity to determine our destiny and to be part and parcel of that global conversation to fight the global issues of the day like climate and the pandemic. All right. Well, that's put me in my place, hasn't no, it? No, not at all. Is it that was Mia Motlow with an incredibly impressive display there. On the, That was the BBC World Service, I think. Mia Motley, you probably recognise her by now because she's gone viral a number of times. There was a brilliant speech about vaccine inequality a couple of months ago and then a speech at COP, um, which we, we showed on Tisky Sal because it was so good, really remarkable, really exceptional. She's an incredible politician, right? I, I, there, there aren't many people who, who, who speak like her, who speak so persuasively. And it's, it's really refreshing, actually, for there to be... A, you know, a politician from the global south who, you know, people in the global north are starting to recognize from a small island state because they're so articulate at putting forward uh, a progressive position when it comes to sort of global politics. She's a, she's a Labour politician. I really like her. I think what's interesting is, like you say, she's a Labour politician and there has not been, despite Barbados becoming a republic, under the leadership of a Labour politician, here we go, oh God, Aaron Brassani always goes back to Keir Starmer. But I found it strange that the Crown, you know, the Queen, the House of Windsor, said congratulations on helping, you know, found a republic. It's a big deal for a country. And yet the British Labour Party couldn't say our sister party in Barbados has achieved this great thing. And, and Europe, we always say, oh, you know, and there is. There is a crisis of social democracy, lack of charismatic politicians, lack of big picture thinking. How do we own the future? Well, you've got a woman. She's, in, she's not in charge. She's the prime minister. She's the leading politician um, in a government in a country of 320,000 people. She's a leading voice on climate change. She's a, a leading voice in terms of global geopolitics. And she's putting her country first and her people first. And so I find it odd that, you know, Europeans, we always say, oh, center left, it's in crisis, it's falling apart. Actually, there's some really inspiring, impressive examples of center left politicians around the world. Mia Motley, more recently, Lou de Silva in Brazil. The point is, of course, if you're not white and if you're not in Western Europe or North America, you don't count. And of course, nothing, nothing is changing. It's a bit like, we'll talk about this a bit later on. Oh, you know, global inequality, nothing's really happening on it. Oh, except if, you know, as long as we don't talk about the 800 million people moved out of, out of poverty by the Chinese Communist Party since 1990. They don't count because, of course, it's the Chinese Communist Party. No, no. 
we, we have to only talk about, you know, where the global south is useless and feckless and they really need us and they're dependent on the global north. That's the conversation legacy media and, 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 and the media political nexus in the global north wants to have. They don't want these people being powerful and assertive and articulate. So mere motley in that sense is, is, is sensational, yes. I am sort of surprised it's taken this long for a global south politician to get this platform because we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, and you know, yeah, there's COP26, but there's been 25 before it. So we increasingly have these kind of global, you know, uh, meetings and events and conferences. We have the transmission mechanisms to take people like this to a mass audience. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I'm kind of surprised that you have a global South politician who's massive on Instagram and Twitter, a bit like AOC is, you know, um, and, and, and who isn't sort of a big variable in, in, in the global North and our political conversation. Long may it continue and intensify. I think it's a really, really, really great thing. You know, I, I think it's a really positive development. Every time one of her videos goes viral, that, I mean, just because she's such a good communicator, they're, all, they're always really phenomenal. I want to I focus a bit more on the substance of the charges being made about Chinese investments in Barbados. Aaron, there you mentioned legacy media and how they cover these issues. The Sunday Times had an article on exactly this last week, which had a pretty loaded headline. Little England, not anymore. Barbados is becoming little China. And then the subheading, awash with cash from Beijing, the island is ditching the queen. Some fear it is simply swapping one colonial master for another. They're linking their, the investments in Barbados by China to Barbados's recent decision to leave the Commonwealth. So they no longer have the queen as their head of state. They're going to have a, a directly elected president. We can go to some of the, the content of, of that piece. Beijing's involvement dates back decades to the Chinese-built Garfield Sobers Gymnasium, an indoor sports facility that opened in 1992. But Chinese projects have multiplied since the government signed up to Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative in 2018, an office devoted to investing in Barbados, recently opened in Beijing. Under a series of agreements between the two countries, China is about to begin refurbishing the derelict national stadium in Bridgetown, upgrade the South Coast sewerage system and erect prefabricated houses made in China for people who lost homes to Hurricane Elsa in July. It has donated a coastal patrol vessel to help Barbados to defend its territorial waters and vaccines to defend against COVID-19. At a Chinese-built housing development in the Christchurch Parish, Mandarin characters were painted on the walls. A woman came to her front door to tell me that she and her neighbours were a Chinese team, I don't know why that's in scare quotes, of doctors at the local Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Then it says, I wondered if a hospital on the island will one day be named after President Xi. But completely, like, complete non sequitur there. You've got, like, all of these investments which just sound really quite good. And then suddenly they're sort of like, oh, they're going to start naming their hospitals after the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. I don't know where it came from at all. Um, I would have, they also did a handy graphic. So let's look at this handy graphic that was in the Sunday Times. A leading title there, How Beijing is Buying Up Barbados. And you can see that the Chinese flag being raised to replace the British flag, which is coming down because they've left the Commonwealth. And then you've got, it's probably a bit small for you to see, but you've got a, a list of various investments. They've built a Confucius Institute at the University of the West Indies, refurbishment of a national stadium in Bridgetown, upgrade of a sewerage system, building a hotel spa resort. As, as I read in that comment, you've got providing prefabricated homes and rebuilding roads. They've also sold Barbados 30 electric buses, donated 30,000 doses of Chinese vaccine and donated a coastal patrol vessel to defend territorial waters. Now, Aaron, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on China-Barbados relations, but looking at that article and that image, it doesn't seem like that the content really justifies the leading headlines because all of these things sound pretty good. You know, donating vaccines, that's not China buying up Barbados. That's you know, obviously there's some geostrategic sort of strategy going on there, but it's but it's a good thing. You know, people were saying this is imperialism. China is just giving these vaccines and building this infrastructure and sending these doctors because it's in their own rational self-interest. Then why don't we do it? If, if that's imperialism, why doesn't the United States do it? You know, I don't think we're talking about it today, but they've just completed the building of an electrified 400 kilometer long rail line in Laos. Laos, which is was the most bombed country in human history in terms of bombs to surface area. So American imperialism is, is sending bombs. I think they dropped something like 2 million tons worth of, um, of bombs, an extraordinary amount of, of ordnance. 
and China is building a rail line. But these things are the same. We don't know which is which is a worse kind of imperialism. I, I think I know what most people in Laos prefer. It's a really sort of ridiculous argument. And I think also the the arrogance of the British. You know, it's been an independent country since the 1960s, Michael. If this was happening in the mid-60s, yeah, you, you're swapping arguably one colonial master for another, whatever. Let's have that debate. But Britain's not been a colonial master in Barbados for, for nearly 60 years. What the hell is this? What do we do for Barbados? We send tourists there. That's great. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they're very grateful that people go there a whole day. It's good for the local economy, whatever. But what does Britain do for, 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 for these places? I know it does, it does marginal amounts, I know, in terms of the Caribbean, in terms of international development aid or whatever, but nothing on this scale. Um, and I, I, So I think it speaks of two things. Once, one is Britain's fundamental, in, or not even Britain, this, this, is, this is in the Sunday Times, right? This is not normal people. One is the British elite's inability to accept that we are no longer an empire. The other is the fact that Asia is going to be the continent of the 21st century, and to a lesser extent Africa, after 2050 probably. Uh, whether it's growth of renewable energy, whether it's technological sort of leadership, whether it's the world's largest cities, whether it's increasing GDP, what, what, any measure they're going to catch up. And because, of course, Asia is so much larger than Europe and North America, you know, still the GDP per capita of China is still like in, in, in nominal terms, I think one sixth of the US. So yes, China is a very wealthy country, but on a per person basis, it's still very, very poor compared to the US. It's entering middle income status. And I hope you want it to catch up, don't you? I, I thought we were told for the last 25 years that free markets and global trade was great because it rises, you know, all boats rise, oh God, except the ones in the global south. We don't want to get too rich because they might do stuff like this. And so very odd. Yes, of course, the Chinese, the Chinese state is doing this and it, it, not, not purely from altruistic reasoning. But the whole point of trade and the whole point of international relations, Michael, is it's not meant to be zero sum. If somebody does something good, and it helps another party, both sides can benefit. You know, David Ricardo talks about that with regards to trade policy in the early 19th century. That's how international relations are meant to operate. And I think the British and many Europeans and the Americans look at international relations as zero sum. Well, if you gain, then I must lose. If we give these people something, then we're, we're, we're missing something at home. So I'm afraid if you want to play that game of sort of a, of a geopolitical big man, you have to put your money where your mouth is. And Britain hasn't done that for a long time. The US hasn't done that for a long time. Uh, certainly on a per head basis, how much it gives abroad and so on is, is appalling. That's that's where we are. Get used to it. And it's very. And look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say China does everything right. Has many civil rights abuses at home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if in the next 30, 40 years we more, move towards a Pax Sinica in parts of the world, a Chinese peace, which I think is is plausible, you know, it's an open question: is will it will a Pax Sinica in East Asia be more peaceful than what we saw during the Cold War of the 60s, the 70s? I think it probably will be. Will China be a more positive force for self-government and state building in Central America than the United States was funding death squads in the 1980s? I think it probably will be. Now, the sort of leftist retort is, oh, you're just, you know, we don't back empires, you know, no to Washington and Moscow and now include Beijing too. Yeah, of course. But if you're Laotian or you're, you know, from Barbados, it's, it's pretty clear which country is, is more favorable and what you prefer, bombs or hospitals. Pretty easy answer.